In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen. For today, 11 July, there is no actual saint of the day, but there is a commemoration of Pope St. Pius I, uh, Pope and Martyr. And he held the chair of St. Peter in the middle of the 2nd century, uh, around the years 140 to 154. Uh, it's unclear uh, from history as uh, the accounts of his martyrdom. We don't know what the circumstances were. Uh, but we hold from tradition, traditionally held to be a martyr, and so uh, that is how he is venerated. Uh, there are those in the modern church who would uh, cast doubt upon this in, in the lack of clear uh, evidence. They would say, well, it, it can't be held to be true, uh, but it's the other way around. It, it, with a lack of clear evidence to the contrary, uh, it must be held to be true uh, because, uh, because of the strength of tradition. That, that is the, the proper position to hold. If it can't be proven otherwise, we're going to believe what tradition tells us. Uh, pope St. Pius I, uh, and the, so the first to hold that illustrious title as Pope, or all the way up to uh, the next Pius would be Pius the Thirteenth. So uh, um, uh, th th this is part of the heritage, the history of the Church, that when popes take a name, uh, it is uh, very often the name of a previous pope that they, they take uh, in uh, going after the memory of those previous popes, the idea that they are not inventing something new, taking a new name, but rather continuing the traditions of those who came before. It's a very Catholic way of thinking. Uh, Pius I was born in northern Italy in the first century, so this would be before the year 100 AD. Uh, so very close to uh, the Apostles Christ our Lord. He was the ninth successor to St. Peter, and among the acts that we do know of him, he decreed that Easter should be kept on Sunday. The Jewish uh, manner of calculating would have placed Easter on a different day of the um, a different day of the week because it was always kept on the 14th of Nisan. Uh, it's kind of like uh, for us the difference between Easter and Christmas. Christmas is always on the calendar day, December 25th, whether it's a Sunday, a Monday, or a Wednesday, or whenever it is. Easter is the other way around. It's always on a Sunday whether it be the 1st, the 3rd, the 15th, the 17th, and so on. So, um, so Pius I was the one to say that Easter is always going to be on Sunday. And now, as we know, actually 50 years later, this would cause some controversy uh, in that Irenaeus of Lyon would have to convince Pope Victor I not to excommunicate the Orthodox, who still wanted to keep Easter on the calendar day rather than the, the specific, uh, rather than on Sunday. So uh, Pius I was the one to establish that rather important tradition. Uh, then later on, Irenaeus of Leon would be the, the bishop, the one who would, we would say, inform the, the future pope it wasn't a matter of dogma, it was just a matter of discipline, so not, not to be excommunicating people over. So we, we see the cooperation of the church there. Uh, Pius I uh, would fight vigorously against the heresies of Gnosticism, uh, specifically Marcion, the heretic. Uh, he would be excommunicate him. And... Uh, an important link between the apostles and the rest of uh, the successors. And something to note is we take for granted the canonical uh, works of the Bible, uh, the New Testament, the Old Testament, 27 new, 46 old. And, but it wasn't always like that. And one of the, in fact, you have the, in the old, the writings, uh, you have the Gospel of Thomas, the Didache, uh, the Shepherd of Hermas, uh, the Acts of St. Paul, and so on. And these books were, at, at certain times, especially early on, considered as canonical. Now, the Shepherd of Hermas was a work written by a certain person named Hermas, and is a collection of parables, some allegory, uh, stories, and so on. You know, good um, admonitions to the Christian Catholic way of living, uh, but not canonical. Irenaeus of Leon counted it canonical, Others did not, um, and it eventually would not be included in the canonical scriptures. But it, it, again, is important for its witness to tradition and the idea that uh, there's many, many writings that support the historicity of the Gospels, uh, uh, the, the practices of early, early uh, Catholicism, early Christianity, and the Shepherd of Hermas is one of them. Now, I bring it up today because uh, Hermas, the name of the author, uh, was the brother of Pope St. Pius I. Uh, born in northern Italy, same, same parents, grew up together. And so th this, this connection here is important because these aren't just writings where we don't know 
what's going on, where they were from, who wrote them. Uh, these are not apocryphal works. We know very well what happened after the apostles uh, died, who their successors were, what they wrote, and it's all very consistent and very historical. So uh, the, um, it's important for us just over and over again to keep reminding ourselves and keep adding to uh, our knowledge of why we believe in the scriptures, why we believe in apostolic succession. It's just all the pieces line up over and over again. And something to, to, to um, um, because not, not too much is known about Pius I, I've already pretty much exhausted that, what I have to say about him, but on the papacy itself, and specifically on the priesthood, uh, which Christ instituted in the Old Testament, or the, the Catholic Church is the fulfillment of the Old Testament, and uh, it's been used, or been said, uh, the term used is foreshadowing. The Old Testament, the old Jewish religion, the old practices of the Mosaic Law and the Covenant uh, foreshadow the Catholic Church, the New Testament, the New Covenant, and, and because God is their author. And if we think about it, foreshadowing. A shadow is the outline of whatever it represents. You, you have a person, a man, a woman, whoever it is. When they cast a shadow, it's the outline, but it's dark. You don't see the detail. You don't see um, really what it, what it is, what exactly the shadow is of, but you know something is there, and you know generally the type. And so that's what foreshadowing is. It's, it's a dark, obscure, mysterious prefigurement. Something else is coming. Something is coming which is going to be made clear, even though it isn't now. But again, it fills the outline. That's what a shadow is. It's the outline of something. And uh, some of the foreshadowings we have in the Old Testament are, of course, the uh, manna in the desert, where we have bread coming down from heaven, feeding the Israelites in the wilderness. Clear foreshadowing of Holy Communion, our Christ our Lord, who is the bread from heaven. At the same time, of course, um, previous to getting the bread from heaven, what had to happen? The Paschal Lamb had to be slain. And that's the foreshadowing of Christ, the Lamb of God, uh, 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 dying on the cross. So with the papacy, with, with the idea of a uh, hierarchy passing from one bishop to the next, uh, that is foreshadowed by the Levitical priesthood, which was handed on from father to son, uh, in that if you were from the line of, of Levi, the tribe of Levi, which was what Moses was from, Moses and Aaron were, of, were Levites, if you were not of the tribe of Levi, you were not a priest. And if you could not prove your lineage, if you could not prove who your father was and who his father was and who his father was, all the way back to Levi, you could not be a priest. The genealogical records were necessary uh, to, for the Old Testament priesthood uh, to exist, Levitical priesthood to exist. Uh, that was a foreshadowing of what? Of the, of the New Testament ordination passed on by Christ. Christ ordained the first apostles bishops. They ordained, uh, uh, ordained bishops after them and priests and so on. And it, it's proven by, uh, we could say, canonical succession. Uh, the the list of the men that we have all the way back to St. Peter, all the popes we have, the bishops who were legitimately consecrated, uh, it's not uh, a biological passing on, a biological lineage, but it's a spiritual one, uh, corresponding to, it's not um, physical birth that makes us members of the church, it's uh, spiritual birth. It's birth in the waters of baptism, uh, not from flesh and blood, um, or as it says in the uh, Gospel of uh, John. And this is so. This is why the idea of the papacy is important because it is that fulfillment of that Old Testament registry, the line of men who trace back to the beginning of the priesthood, which of, of course is Christ. In the Old Testament, uh, Levi, Aaron, and Moses. In the New Testament, it is Christ. Um, in Jerusalem, the Jews had to keep. They kept genealogical records of everybody going back. They kept the line of the men who had been high priests and so on, so that they could prove legitimacy of, of their Jewish priesthood. And those were lost in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 AD. Uh, and that is one of the, another reason why the, the Jews, the modern day Jews, have nothing to do with Old Testament Jews. The Old Testament um, chosen people of God don't exist anymore. Uh, they were gone. It's over. They, they don't have a the priesthood. They can't trace their lineage. Uh, there, there is no more chosen people of God. As I've said many times before, the Catholic Church, this is the new chosen people of God. A modern-day Jews is like any, any other unbaptized people, Mormons, uh, Muslims, whatever it may be. Nothing special about them, whatever. And, and so this idea that, they're, they're, that the, the papacy is not 
willed of God, or the papacy is unnecessary, or that the Pope is, you know, representing the whore of Babylon or whatever. It just, it, it, it doesn't make sense. It is the, the, it, how is Christ's lineage going to be proven? Uh, otherwise, it's just this mad um, uh, claim to the, 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 the priesthood that, that anybody can make. Well, where's your proof? Where's your lineage? Where, where's the history, right? Where's the fulfillment of that Old Testament foreshadowing? Uh, so it's very easy to see uh, when you have a proper understanding of scriptures, when you take them in their entirety, both old and new, and you don't go uh, approach them picking and choosing you know, what, what you want to be true, what you don't want to be true, which is what uh, heretics always do. They go to the scriptures, pick and choose what's going to fit their doctrine, uh, rather than the Catholic Church, which is developed by looking at all of scripture. Well, we don't know what we're supposed to do. What's the Catholic Church supposed to be? Well, let's look at scripture and find out. And that's what they did from the very beginning, and that's how the church developed. That's how the church got uh, the mass that she has now, the doctrine, the dogma, the catechism, and so on, the councils. Uh, that was all that development from taking Scripture in its entirety. Uh, if we go back now, we want to second-guess those councils and cast suspicion on the past and on our ancestors and on traditions. Sounds more like picking and choosing rather than continuing. Uh, so that, that is, um, just again, another one of the foundations of our faith, our security and our safety in remembering these saints of the past, uh, Pius I, um, uh, and, and all the many other, other popes and men that have come before, uh, the fathers of the church, the apostolic fathers, our, our faith rests on a solid and firm foundation indeed, and let us not forget that. So let's ask all holy popes, especially Pius I, uh, pray for us for an increase in faith. God bless you all in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost.